All right, welcome to Dream Lab. One more time, this will be our third try, and we're going to hope and pray that this time works. So I'm going to be talking to you and double checking some things here real quick to check out whether we are working or not, and hopefully you let me know. Once again, we hopefully have a um, a feed here that I can see uh, where we're back up and online again. Let me just check it out. Okay, looks like we have sound this time. So we're going to hope for that. Um, you're going to have to let me know because if I keep the sound turned on here on my end, then it creates a bit of a problem with feedback. So we had to drop our typical mechanisms for running the broadcast, which means we will not be able to do dreams live uh, with you sharing them via video, but we'll try and do a few. Uh, using some of the comment sections and things of that nature. Uh, we're going to run with what works for tonight. Uh, since we've had so much trouble with sound, I'm going to give it just a few minutes as people are popping online. We had about 10 or 12 who had gotten online uh, when we lost our feed earlier. So we're going to give it just a minute and talk about things before we jump into our lesson tonight. I apologize for the challenges we're having. Uh, but this is a new effort for us to post up and online in this way. It, we really need for it to work, and we'll be working on some things to make it more functional uh, by next time around. You guys all know you've been with me, many of you have been with me for enough Dream Labs to know that every month we're having to try and um, do new little pieces to make this more functional, and that means technology that is um, – uh, we're learning as we go. So, hello, Sheila, Angela, uh, Katie, uh, Shelby, I see, Sarah, uh, Bridget, uh, Mary, uh, all you guys, glad to have you. Glad we have some sound running and working right now. I see Kathy Brown's just jumped back on. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Kathy Brown typically helps us with our interpreting our dreams via the comments. So, if you have a dream, you post in the comments. She'll probably be helping with that. If I notice anybody else, Art Hernandez also helps if he gets on here in a little bit. So keep that in mind. If those guys are helping you with an interpretation, then we trust them and everything's good. Uh, so glad to have you guys home. Uh, hopefully, uh, Kathy's internet will work on her end. We're having just technological issues. But those of you who don't know Kathy Brown, she is a missionary in Honduras. So she has both technological issues and internet issues at times. So it, it all works. So now that you can hear me and now that we're functioning reasonably well here on Facebook alone, let's, uh, let's pray one more time and then jump into our discussion tonight. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, we just want to thank you for this. Uh, despite the challenges we've had with getting this stream online, we want to thank you that you have made it possible and that we have things uh, working. And so, Lord, we ask you to put your hand on this time tonight, that we would grow together, we would learn together. And even if I can't hear others and I can't uh, see their faces, Lord, that you would allow us to function through the comment section and things would just flow in a good way. Would you open our, our eyes to see, our ears to hear, and our hearts to understand what you have in store for us tonight in Jesus' name. Okay, so with that, we're going to talk about recurring dreams tonight. I feel like this is the, like the fifth or sixth times I've, I've said this, but I know most of you haven't heard me say it yet. So we're going to talk about recurring dreams. I was meeting with someone earlier today and the topic came up of recurring dreams, and so I just felt like... Usually when that stirs or something happens like that, uh, it's, it's, it's a good indication to me. It's something we need to talk about because others may be dealing with the same concept. So recurring dreams. Um, what does it mean when I have a dream twice? What does it mean when I have a dream over and over and over again? And it's a continuous process. In some people's cases, I have dreams every few nights perhaps for years, months, weeks, years at a time. And, and when we say recurring dreams, I want you to be sure you understand something. Uh, when we talk about a recurring dream, I want to be clear that we do not mean it has to be the exact same dream every time. Elements of the dream can be different, but if the 
core of the dream, if the, 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 the central focus of the dream is the same, we would term that as a recurring dream. So let's talk about recurring dreams and the types of recurring dreams that people deal with. And we're going to begin with the simplest form of that. The simplest form of recurring dream would be the type of dream that would be a dream that is established. Uh, dreaming a dream twice. Uh, that would be effectively the type of dream that um, Pharaoh had that Joseph explained to him what that dream, uh, what, what the reason he had dreamed it twice would be. You can look up that story of Pharaoh and Joseph and their dream. And what you'll find is that Joseph explains to Pharaoh that when the dream occurs twice, that it means it is established. It is going to come to pass. That's the dream that Pharaoh had concerning the famine that would come to Egypt. And when we deal with that dream, you'll also notice that it is a dream that relates to two completely different elements, two completely different symbol packages in the dream. In one dream, we have the seven uh, fat cows and the seven lean cows. In a second dream, we have the seven uh, fat sheaves of, of wheat and the seven thin sheaves of wheat. And so in that setting, what you're going to find is that though the elements of the dream was were different, the bottom line is that the dream itself spoke to the same topic. That was the seven years of famine. So when Joseph explains that this type of a dream, the thing twice, means it's established, he's explaining to Pharaoh that you've got to get ready for this. There's nothing you can do. There's, there, there's no way. You're not going to pray. You're not going to turn this around. This is saying this is coming. Get ready for it. That's a dream when it, we, when it occurs twice. Now, what's interesting about that, and sometimes people really struggle with the idea of repetitive dreams and recurring dreams that occur over and over and over and over again. And particularly in the realm of nightmares and in the realm of spiritual warfare dreams, that can be very troubling. Because if we presume that they treat recurring dreams in the same way you would treat a dual dream or a tw two times dream, a repeated dream, then you've got a spiritual warfare dream that occurs over and over and over again, and you end up with an individual who's terrified that that means there's nothing I can do about this. This is going to happen, and I'm facing all this difficulty, all this challenge, etc. So what I want you to keep in mind when it comes to uh, repeat dreams, that is a dream once, then a dream a second time, that standard is it is established. But when we look at recurring dreams, that is dreams that occur over and over and over again, you're typically speaking more to the idea that this is a dream that is saying to you, pay attention. I don't want you to miss what I'm saying to you. This is important. You're not catching what I'm saying, that type of thing. So the repeat dream is established. The recurring, repetitive dream is much more of a dream that says, you need to hear what I'm saying. Now, <clears throat> why is that important? It's important because the enemy will throw recurring dreams at us just like the Lord opens the door to. And when we're dealing with those spiritual warfare dreams, like I was talking about, you don't want to get into fear. You don't want to move into a place where you've got this recurring spiritual warfare dream and suddenly you're terrified that that your life is over. Things are ruined. Things are horrible. Or you're constantly going to be in this battle. And, and, and the enemy would like you to take that that uh, understanding of the repeat dream concept where Joseph talks about it to Pharaoh and tear you apart with it. See, one of the things the enemy loves to do is to take truth, subtly twist it, and make it something that it's not. One of the first tactics he ever used was that subtle deception, just a slight shift in understanding. So when well, let me give you the example of that, where it occurs. Book of Genesis, chapter 1 and 2. In the book of Genesis, you're going to find the fall of Adam and Eve. And you'll find that they were given certain instructions about eating from fruit fruit from the trees in the garden. They had, on one hand, the tree of life, 
And on the other hand, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And God says to Adam and Eve, don't eat from the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And what happens is they go along for quite some time doing perfectly well with not eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But then along comes a serpent. And by the way, have you ever wondered why in the world was Eve listening to a First place. Didn't it seem strange that this snake is talking to her, that an animal is talking? Maybe C.S. Lewis had it right. Maybe Chronicles of Narnia has more truth to it than we thought, and maybe the animals did talk, and that's why she wasn't surprised with it. So anyway, whatever whatever it was there, that, I can run on a tangent. Whatever it was there, what we do know is that what the enemy tells Eve is a subtle deception. It is not about him tempting her to eat from that tree. It is about her, him convincing her she can't trust what God said. That's what the real issue is in the garden. Same concept with what he's doing with you when he tries to tell you you have a recurring dream that, that has been thrown at you and it means you can do nothing about it. It's a subtle shift. The repeat dream, the twice dream, uh, where the Lord is emphasizing something in that way is established. But the recurring dream is a reminder to you. So what did the, the serpent do in the garden? He tells Eve, he says, hey, Eve, didn't God tell you that you shouldn't eat from the fruit of this tree, nor that you should even touch it? OK, now, interestingly, if you'll go back and read Genesis one and two carefully, you'll find God never said don't touch it. It's the serpent who adds don't touch it, throwing just that little piece of doubt into what Eve had heard. And now she begins to think, wait a minute. I understand not eating, but why would the Lord not even want me to touch it? What's the issue here? Isn't this a little extreme? So he begins to throw Eve into that turmoil that puts her into fear that then throws her into a place where she distrusts what God has said and begins to try and resolve things in her own mechanism to see what happens. Same principle when we deal with repetitive dreams versus a repeat dream. Uh, that a dual occurrence of a dream. The enemy wants you to believe there's nothing you can do about it, that it's pinned you down and that you're stuck with it. When in reality, it may just be the Lord saying, pay attention. Now, the thing that comes up in this topic is the issue of how in the world does the enemy throw these spiritual warfare dreams at you in the first place? Whether it be a repetitive dream or just an individual nightmare or night terror or a bad dream or a demonic inspired dream, how is it that the enemy does that? Well, you know, is he controlling my mind in some way? Is he uh, putting into my mind this dream? Is he creating this whole scenario and then throwing it at me and invading my mind in some way? Well, let's think about this. The first thing we want to talk about when it comes to that, and this is all designed to keep you from A, being entering into fear over nightmares and night terrors, but B, to keep you from uh, letting the enemy deceive you when you have these repetitive dreams that are trying to hammer you over and over again in something, particularly the spiritual warfare uh, type. So what is it, how is it the enemy does this? First, let's talk about how the enemy impacts our mind. Uh, because when we're sleeping, he's impacting that element of our soul. Our mind is at rest, and he's throwing these darts at it. But the one question that relates to this and tends to come up is, can he read my mind? Can the enemy know what I'm thinking? The answer to that question is no. He doesn't have the ability to enter into your mind and know what you're thinking. Now, I'll get back to some scripture and some proof on that, but let's think about the implications of that for just a minute. If the enemy can't read your mind, then how can he piece together and create a dream that he places into your mind? So his inability to read your mind is actually a good indication to us that he can't implant that dream in our mind. So starting back again, taking us back to our base level, how do we know he can't read our mind? We've got a couple of scriptures that will give us a good indication that he can't read our mind. First one comes in the book of Exodus when we see Moses uh, being born and brought on the scene in Egypt. If you'll remember, 
the enemy knew something was happening, something was up, that God was about to do something. So he put into Pharaoh's heart to kill all the male children. This was an endeavor that they would never be born, that Moses would not even be born. But Moses ultimately ends up born. How is it that the enemy had to kill all male children because he couldn't enter into the mind of man to know which child was Pharaoh, which child was Moses. He, he couldn't read the mind to determine who Moses was. Secondly, we have the same scenario when it comes to Jesus. That's a New Testament example. When Jesus comes on the scene and he's born, uh, Pilate or, or, or Herod, I'm sorry, uh, ends up killing all the children under a certain age, okay? So what's going on there? He can't read the minds. He can't enter into the mind and find out who that person is, who Jesus is. So he's having to make a broad swath and try and catch Jesus in this net and, and capture him in order to uh, eliminate him from the scene. So those are two pretty good indications to us that our adversary can't get into the mind of an individual. That is knowing what's going on inside that mind. So now the question arises, then how does he do the dreams? How does he influence us? Where do those demonic dreams come from? How do they get in? And, and what do we do about it? So now we're talking about the enemy's um, uh, capacity to learn and grow. Okay. When Satan was cast out of heaven, when the one third of the heavenly host falls, it, it doesn't mean they lost their capacity to understand and to grow. So now we have to, it just means they lost their light. Okay. God is the God of light. from the God of light, your light begins to become darkness. Several scriptures on that we don't have time to go to right now, but the enemy loses his light. He begins to fade in his light. However, um, when we look at his capacity to learn, it didn't go away. So he's had, let's see, what is it, about 6,000 years to study human psychology, to learn how to manipulate man, to learn thought processes and thought patterns. And if you ever consider some of these guys who are out there in the entertainment world, uh, some of them are called psychics, some of them are called stage magicians of different kinds, illusionists, etc. But the really cool ones are the ones that are coming up more recently now. You'll see them on things like America's Got Talent and different shows like that, where they manipulate an entire studio audience and everybody picks the same card or everybody uh, takes the, writes the same thing down or whatever. That's a process in which they've learned human psychology in such a way that they can plant a thought in your mind without ever knowing what you're thinking. Now, if a human can do that with just, what, 20, 30, 40 years at most experience in learning those principles, how do you think the demonic world works? They've had 6,000 years to learn those principles, and they will certainly be able to manipulate our thought processes. So the enemy, when you have a dream from the enemy, particularly those recurring dreams and those spiritual warfare dreams uh, that are recurring, it is not the enemy controlling your mind and forcing you to dream a certain dream. It is the enemy planting seeds, suggestions, thoughts to you that allow the creation of that dream to come out of your own soul. Now, that's manipulation. It is not control. The result of that and the reason it's important is you carry authority. So there's two ways to respond to recurring repetitive dreams. When you are dealing with a recurring dream that relates to something God is saying to you, he is giving you that revelatory word, that revelation of a dream. You want to listen to it because having it over and over and over again is saying to you, you didn't get this yet. I'm going to keep putting it before you until you catch on to what I'm saying. 
When you're dealing with the enemy giving you that recurring dream, typically designed for warfare or fear, we carry authority and the right to stop it and cut it off because the enemy does not have the right to invade your mind and force a dream. You carry that authority. Very important for you to understand. Very important for you to learn to take authority over that. We talked about this, I believe it may have been last month. You can go back to the archive, and, and, and uh, if it was not last month, it was recently in one of our dream labs about how to deal with nightmares uh, and how to deal with uh, spiritual warfare dreams, fear dreams, demonic dreams, recurring dreams in those arenas is take authority over it, just like you would the nightmare. Don't let those things linger and continue. They're thoughts planted, but they're not forced dreams. So you can stop them, and that becomes a valuable tool for you to utilize and use to overcome the way the enemy wants to sow fear. Now, when it comes to, to dreams that are recurring repetitively from God, you don't want to stop those. You don't want to take authority over a dream God has given you. First of all, you can't take authority over God, so he's going to keep bringing you the dream, but you don't want um, um, uh, to, to press that issue with him of, of uh, trying to stop it. You want to give him liberty to speak into your life. Now, when the Lord uh, speaks into your life, you want to pay attention. So rather than trying to stop him and taking authority over it, you want to begin to pray in this way. You've got this recurring repetitive dream. Now, granted, there are times when dreams from God can be a little scary, a little um, awe-inspiring, a little stressful, uh, until we understand what they mean. So don't confuse that little spiritual fear, that little all of God fear, that little I need to get this right fear with a seed of true fear or terror that the enemy sows. So now you're dealing with a recurring dream that you, you've got this sense, this feel, it's in color, it, it's the feel of the dream is good when you wake up, you know the Lord is trying to say something, even though it's, it's, it's a, a little challenging to you, uh, but you're dealing with this issue, this recurring dream, you're not gonna take authority over it, cut it off like we would a night terror or a spiritual warfare dream, but what do I do to respond to the recurring dream from God? Recognize why you're getting it. You're getting that dream because you're not catching on to something he's trying to say. So whether you have an interpretation or don't have an interpretation, the response to that type of a dream is to stop and pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, will you reveal to me what it is you're trying to say? Will you bring other mechanisms of your voice? Will you speak to me through prophetic people? Will you speak to me through your word? Will you speak to me as a, as a still small voice in my spirit? Will you help me to understand what you're trying to say? Because I recognize that you're saying something to me that I'm not getting. And therefore, Lord, I want you to open up my understanding to hear what you're trying to say. Then you begin to take positive steps. As soon as you recognize what the dream is about, you want to then take positive steps to try and deal with the issue the Lord has focused you on. So you don't want to just say, oh, great, I heard you, but then do nothing. That's another reason you'll see continuous recurring dreams from the Lord. One, we didn't understand. Second, we're not responding to what he's saying. And so he keeps telling us the same thing. So ask him to bring you revelation to understand what he's trying to tell you. And then secondly, speak to him, go, go before him and, and, and ask him to show you how you can respond to the dream in such a way that you're able to deal with what the issue is that he's bringing up. That's the two ways that you deal with repetitive dreams from the Lord. And then the two ways you dream of the repetitive dreams from the Lord versus the enemy. Cut off the enemies, respond to the Lord's. Once you have understanding of the dreams and you begin to respond to them for the Lord, or you take authority over them from the enemy, you'll see repetitive dreams cut off. They'll stop occurring. Or you may move into another type of dream or another um, series of dreams to deal with another issue. But once you begin to deal with the issue, the Lord wants you to understand an ongoing repetitive dream on the same topic will stop. 
You don't have to take authority over the Lord. You respond to it at the end. Okay? Make sense? Good. Now, I see one note here, Shirley. I see you talk about dreaming and color a lot lately. Let me just real quickly mention, since you raised that topic, um, uh, I've said this over and over again, but it never hurts to repeat some of our topics. And since tonight, we're probably going to be doing more teaching and talking than we're going to be able to do dream interpretation. It's a good opportunity to say this. And by the way, if you have a dream you'd like to interpret it, and you can do it in like one short paragraph, you can go ahead and type that in the comments. I'll pick those up, or some of the other uh, uh, of our of our um, helpers will pick them up and uh, give you an interpretation, either written in the comment section or uh, speaking um, uh, to you through the video. Yeah, Javina, you do type it in the comment section tonight. It's the only option we have tonight. Sorry about that. Uh, so, but while we're waiting on some of you to, to uh, maybe put a few dreams in so we can pick one or two to try and work with, uh, let's deal with the topic of color. This will be a repeat for some of you, but it is important to mention and, and to repeat every now and then. Color dreams are dreams that come from God. Black and white and muted color dreams are dreams that come from the enemy. Now, that's about as 100% true as anything we talk about with dreams, but you can't take it as 100% true for this reason. We sometimes think we remember a dream in color that was actually muted color, dull color, or black and white, and we sometimes think a dream was without color when it was actually just normal, everyday color, and it didn't stand out to us, so we don't remember that it was in color. And so we can't be 100% Color dreams are from God. Muted, dull, black and white dreams are from the enemy. Uh, vivid, bright, clarity, absolute vivid color, you can almost guarantee it's going to be from the Lord. But, and, and truly dark, black and white, clearly no color in it at all dreams are going to be almost guaranteed to be from the enemy. But there's that gray area in between where we transition from one to the other that gives us a little bit of a challenge and, and presents us with this place where we can't say 100%. It's always your answer. Now, the next question some of you may ask, you can go back and read on the blog, on the website, um, the www.mydreamstories.com. You can read the blog there and find uh, some written material on this. But let me just say very quickly, uh, 1 John says God is light. He's not only love, he's also light. And what we know about color is you cannot have color without light. Light is required in order for color to be created. So if the enemy has been cast out of God's presence, he's no longer in the presence of the Lord. He's no longer the recipient of the light of God. He then dwells in darkness and he has no light with which to create color. Secondly, the enemy is not a creator. He is a counterfeiter and a copier. He's a fraud. But that, because of that, he can't create vivid light colored dreams. He can only imitate and counterfeit them. And the counterfeit's never going to be as good as the original. Therefore, we end up with black and white, dark or muted colored dreams uh, coming from the enemy. Now, with that said, we got our first dream uh, listed here. Christina uh, Baird, I see your dream here. I'm going to read it for the sake of folks who may not be uh, working through the comment section. And we're going to go ahead and jump right into trying to interpret two or three dreams tonight and see how we do uh, and how we go tonight. We'll be a little bit shorter tonight, by the way, just because of the challenges we're having. Uh, before I move on, Kathy Brown, you mentioned all you heard was Moses ends up being born. Uh, that was a comment in connection with the enemy couldn't read the mind of Moses' mother to know who Moses was. So Moses ends up born, not killed, because Pharaoh didn't know who he was. So, uh, Christina, let's see here. My husband and son, nine-year-old son, uh, Isaac went to the beach to watch wi the wild Mustang horses run or stampede on the beach. The water was deep and clear, and you could see the horses in the water. My husband was with my son on the shore at a wood fence, which was also underwater. I was nervous because my son was now underwater, and when the waves came crashing down, he was holding on to the wood post. My husband looked at me and told me he was fine. Great dream. 
that's a phenomenal dream. I don't know if you recall whether it was in color or not, but I, this is where we can define something. The feel of a dream and the discernment of a dream is more important right now to us because we don't always get color correct than whether it's in black and white or color is. And this dream, I would just about guarantee you, whether you remember it or not, was in color because it's a God dream. This is a dream about your son and about the sphere of influence he's going to have. That dream, just let me speak to very quickly, it's interpretation, and we'll go back and look at a couple of the elements. This means that your son, your, your husband has an impact upon your son to train him up in the things of God, to get him into the things of the spirit where he can see the power of God move before him in an awesome way and to keep him grounded in a fashion that will keep him safe and secure no matter what the circumstances appear to be. Powerful, amazing dream. Now, how do we get that out of this dream? Let's look at this. We've got a couple of elements here that point us in that direction. First of all, we're going to look at this dream and we're going to say, who is the dream about? Uh, Christina, I assume you're the one who had the dream and you're not in the dream. You're observing or you're watching. When we're observing or watching someone else or something else in our dreams, those dreams tend to be what we call extrinsic dreams, dreams about the other rather than dreams about ourselves, which would be an intrinsic dream. The wild mustangs, the horses, horses frequently, there are many things they can speak to, but one of the things that horses often speak to is power. When we come to the beach and the ocean and the deep water, water often speaks of things of the spirit and moving into the depths of the Lord. The fence posts set firmly into the, uh, the ground, but coming under the water would speak to the idea of something that's grounded and has boundaries to keep you secure or safe. Holding on to that fence post then speaks to being grounded or being able to hold on to the truth that keeps you in the deep things of God. The fact that your husband is tending to your son and acknowledging and recognizing that he is fine is speaking to his role in raising your son up in the realm of spiritual things to have an impact on him and to train him up in the way he should go. So those are all little elements that point us to the understanding of the dream. Now, uh, something I should point out here that I think is important is sometimes people will get this idea that um, because I tend to give, uh, I don't want to say, this is, I don't intend this in any boastful way, this is just experience. Because I tend to give a more eloquent interpretation, putting the language together quickly and in a fashion that's that's easy to understand and sounds nice, that I've got a greater gift than they do. No, I've been doing it longer than you have, is basically what it boils down to. The gift of God is the same. He is not a respecter of persons. The gift of understanding a dream, of it opening up for us, is going to be the same from person to person. But this will be the experiences we have in learning how to present what we've heard and what we've seen. That's the real difference there. So if you hear me give a quick, succinct, or eloquent interpretation to a dream or lay it out in a simple format, it's not because I have a greater gift than you. I want you to be able to interpret these dreams too, okay? It's because I've done it longer and I'm more comfortable with the way I might say things. All right, let's jump on to the next dream here. Sheila, you've got a dream here. You dream that you were out in the open. It says, I dreamed that I was out in the open and I caught a black mamba and put it in a pet carrier so that I could release it somewhere that it wouldn't harm anyone else. That's all I remember about the dream. It wasn't fearful of it, didn't harm me, and actually capturing the snake was pretty quick. Again, great dream. Let's take a, a couple of comments on this dream so we can learn from it first, and then we'll go into the interpretation of it. Many times when there are fearful elements of a dream, for example, there are not many people that the idea of dealing with a black mamba, one of the most venomous snakes on the planet, there are very few people who could have that dream without sort of creeping them out a little bit, but at least stirring them a little bit to be a little worried. 
But one thing we see here that points us to this not being a fear drain and not being a demonic drain without having a color reference here, because you could tell me, but we don't have it yet, uh, without having a color reference here is again, we go back to discernment. We look at this and we say, we take very important Sheila's statement, I wasn't fearful of it and it didn't harm me. That statement is a clear indicator that the natural response to the situation did not occur and a supernatural response did occur. The lack of fear, the ease and quickness of the capture and the, the fact that there was safety and security in the process tells us this is probably not a dream from the enemy. He would be sowing some form of fear. Okay, so when we look at this dream, what we're going to see is that uh, is that um, uh, we find that it is a dream that speaks to something snakes often speak of, which is lies and deceit. Okay, there's a couple of reasons snakes speak to that. They come from the biblical uh, metaphor of the snake in the garden and the deceit he sowed. They come from a, a colloquialism or a uh, an idea that snakes are uh, crawling their bellies, they're low life, okay? Uh, we also come at it from the mindset of just a, um, a picture that comes in our mind, a sort of a word play, a type of a word play, and that would be the idea that um, um, a snake is a little bitty head and a long tail. Okay, so a tail, T-A-L-E, as opposed to T-A-I-L, is a wordplay or a pun, meaning a story or a fiction. Uh, the other thing we get, snakes can be venomous. That is, what comes from their mouth poisons us. So all of those things will speak to the idea that snakes can represent and speak to deception, lies, and things of that nature. So what this dream is saying to you, Sheila, is the Lord is going to give you insight to stop significant attacks that the enemy would bring through the words of others and to counteract them in such a way that the words would have no effect and no capacity to cause harm to the people they were intended to hurt. So this is about a prayer assignment, an intercessory assignment, but maybe even a counseling wisdom or intervention into some people's lives. It's interesting that you were catching the snake and moving it away, getting it to a place that you couldn't harm someone else. You weren't worried about getting hurt. That means the lies, the deception, is probably not something that is directed towards you or about you, but rather it's you intervening on behalf of others to keep them safe and secure. All right? So, great dream. Uh, I got a question here about the first dream we did. What about the stampede and the Mustangs and the meaning? It's that raw power that comes from those stampeding horses, that power moving before him in what we would call an untamed natural state. That's the thing, the idea that comes from a wild Mustang. It's something that's free and it and it just, it's, there's no boundaries and no restrictions on it. That's the idea from a wild Mustang. So that's why that related there. Uh, so um, uh, Biff, hopefully that helps you with that meaning. So let's see here, the next dream I have on the list here, this is kind of fun being able to run through them on the list like this. Uh, I hope it is for you guys. I can't see necessarily uh, your responses. I uh, can when people are live in the, in the audience, but but I'm having a good time. So let's go on to Michael Warden's dreams. Dream, and those of you who are typing dreams in, you probably want to hold on for a little bit. Let me try and get through some of the ones that are up on the screen now and see what kind of time we have and how we're doing. And then we'll come uh, back and if we get toward the end of those, open it up to type in some additional ones. But Michael, your dream, let's read it here for everybody. I had a dream that uh, I walked outside from my house and all of a sudden I was flying. I was going through the clouds. Then I landed and I was in a giant field of all kinds of brilliant colors. When I landed, my clothes had changed and I was in like a blue suit. Then I woke up. Wow, I love these dreams tonight. Great. Michael, this is an amazingly good dream. 
On this one, we'll jump back to our, our, our pattern of giving you an interpretation first and coming back and talking through it. This dream says God is moving into a place of revelatory gifting that is about to open up the heavens for you to be able to hear and perceive in new ways. He's going to take you to a place where there's a real openness to receive from his spirit in many different ways, in many different fashions, but he's really going to clothe you in a revelatory gift, in a gift of hearing and understanding his voice. Uh, so it's a great, great dream. Where does that come from in this dream? How do we get there from this? Remember our earlier dreams, uh, both of which to some degree were extrinsic. The first one about the Mustangs, definitely extrinsic about others. The second one was an intrinsic, extrinsic dream. That is the dream about the snake being a dream that says this is about an assignment I have, but an assignment for others. This dream is a clear intrinsic dream, a dream that is about the dreamer. You're the sole focus of the dream. You're the only element in the dream that is in the center of attention. A couple of things that tell us and confirm for us that this dream is about revelation, revelatory gifting. Uh, if I ask you to raise your hand, if you're in, in a classroom with me right now, I would say that I bet, uh, 90% of the people online are watching this by video later. If I said, how many of you have had flying dreams? Many, 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 many of you will have had them or you'll know people who've had them. They're very common dreams. Why? Because those dreams speak of moving into the heavens, flowing in the things of the wind and spirit around us, flowing in revelation. Okay. And we are created as a revelatory people. We were created to hear God's voice. That's why he wants to speak to us and he wants to reveal himself to us. So that's something that would be common for us to experience and to, to, to have an experience with. So I love that concept that many, many of us will have those dreams about becoming revelatory people. In this particular dream, it's not only flying that tells us this is about God opening up revelation. It is also the idea that when you landed, you're in the giant field, an open heaven, a field with colors all around you. And I envision that like a field of beautiful, brilliantly colored flowers. Doesn't have to be that it was flowers, but it's that picture. It gives me that open field image in my mind when I'm hearing the dream. And what we see there is this idea that the, all the colors and the different things they represent, the creative, creativity, the creative nature of God, the light of God, the revelation of God is all brought forth out of those colors as well. Then finally, the last thing is the suit. Wearing a suit means you're prepared. You're ready to go to work. You're ready for a, a professional responsibility, so to speak. Most of the people who wear suits every day are professionals, businessmen. You're getting down to business. And what are you clothed in? What are you covered in? A blue suit. Blue being a color of revelation, a color frequently and repetitively related to the idea of revelatory things. So we have three different elements of this dream flying, the open field with the brilliant colors and the blue suit that all three point us to this dream being about moving into a place of revelation. Great, great dream. All right, let's see. Uh, hey, Rick Penny, I just saw your name on there that you joined. Glad to have you. Rick's in Australia. So good to, I don't know what time of day it is over there, but good to see you. Uh, Sarah, we got Sarah's dream up next. Sarah Jones says, I was riding in a car on a winding road that had steep hills. I came to a stop where it faded into a uh, male guide of sort who was becoming, uh, becoming me to follow, beckoning me, I assume that means, to follow him. I agreed. He unzipped an invisible curtain in the atmosphere, revealing the most vivid, colorful world. I was, it was beautiful, fun, vibrant, and full of life. I followed him inside this other realm and felt joy, no hesitation. It's all I remember. Whoa, cool dreams. These are just amazing dreams. I love the fact that dreams tend to come in these little theme packages as well. Uh, so this, is, this next dream is very similar to the one we did for Michael Warden. It speaks about revelation, but more specifically, this dream speaks about the journey that you're on, Sarah. God has had you on a journey that's had a lot of twists and turns to it, but he's bringing you to a place. He's bringing you to a point in the journey when you're going to be able to move into a deeper 
understanding, a deeper experiential understanding of the spiritual realm. It's that heavenly encounter type thing. Moving into a new way of seeing, thinking, hearing, and experiencing. Uh, I love the imagery of this dream. It says, you've been on that path that's had these twists and turns, but the time is now. You're coming to that place where there's a stop to what has been and a start to something new. I also love the fact that the winding road had steep hills. That says the journey you've had was not an easy one. Not only were there lots of twists and turns where you could have gotten lost, but it's been arduous. It's been challenging to reach this goal. But the Lord wants you to know that no matter how difficult the journey has been, he has seen you through and you're reaching the point to enter into the heavenly realms and understand new and exciting things. Great, great dream. Let's take a couple of the elements of this dream and walk through how we come to this interpretation. I love, one of the things I love about this is the picture of the road. Roads so often speak of journeys. It's, it's the pathway that takes us from one place to another. If a vehicle, car, plane, uh, uh, boat, uh, submarine, helicopter, whatever. If a vehicle is the means by we, which we get from one place to another, which would often speak of our life or our ministry, then the road or the path is the uh, the the method or the, the 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 road would be the pathway by which we get there, the journey that we're on. So it's a great great picture. And, and I love the different natures of a road, a paved road, a dirt road, a winding road, a hilly road, a mountain road, a valley road, a snowy road. All of those things will have paint pictures of what the journey has been like. So this winding road with steep hills tells us this hasn't been easy. It's been a challenging journey. But then this idea of the Lord stepping out in front of you, the Lord revealing himself to you. We don't even have to know who the man was who's going to be the guide here. We know from his supernatural capacity to pull the veil apart, the invisible curtain, to pull that veil apart, to unzip it and give you access that this is the Lord. He's inviting you in and offering you that opportunity. The vividness and the distinction between where you were and where you go into is something that then speaks to the idea that there is an entering into the spiritual realm where the things of the spirit become greater, have greater clarity and, and become a, a greater uh, visibility to you. So great, great thing, Sarah. Look forward to what God has in store with you with new revelation and new things that keep taking you in and keep pressing into that place. All right, I think Kathy is able now, some of these ladder dreams down toward the end, she's beginning to work on and help you with uh, online on the chat there. Just let her keep doing that. Uh, Crystal, uh, I've got your dream was next up on the list here. Uh, well, hey, Paul Gazelka, good to see you, man. I just saw your name on here. I'm just, some of you probably been on for a little while before I see you, but good, good to have you with us tonight. Um, Crystal, your dream. I had a dream that a wedding had taken place behind me and my husband's back. The wedding involved friends and family. In the dream, I remember feeling betrayed. One thing that stood out is the bridal party, family and friends, were wearing knitted white attire as they walked down the aisles. Interesting dream. Well, a cool elements to this dream that, that put us in a place of saying, What's, what is it about this? Now, one of the things I want to talk about before we interpret this one, one of the things about this dream is, again, it, we're, we're not going to be worried about color or black and white or muted. We want to feel from the dream. And the feeling in this dream is betrayal. So there's something about this wedding that is not right. There's something about it taking place behind your back or in a betrayal type setting that tells us that whether this dream is from God or from the enemy, in, in all likelihood, based upon my feel for this dream, I would assume the dream was in color and it's a dream from God. And that's where we want to be careful that we don't assume because there's a feeling of betrayal or a negative feeling, it automatically makes it a demonic dream or a soul dream. It can be a dream from God telling us to guard ourselves from something or to be careful in some place. 
something that we may be about to face or deal with. So in this dream, we have a feel here that says there's something that's going coming that we have to be careful with, but it doesn't make it a negative dream. Make sense? Okay. Now, what we see in this dream is that there are some covenants being entered into behind your back. In other words, there's some things that you're not privy to that people around you are making decisions and entering into a posture or a position that is man inspired and not God ordained. And the Lord is preparing you that you would not be caught off guard by this and you would not be hurt by this, but you would be aware of it. And rather than the feeling of betrayal pulling you down, you would be prepared and be able to offer aid, prayer and support into the situation. Where do we get this? The, the wedding. Weddings are about covenant. Weddings have to do with covenant. We're entering into a covenant, an agreement of positioning ourselves joined one to another. So this is about someone who is uh, not properly connected, going behind your back, Crystal, who is entering into a place of agreement or a covenant that can have negative contract co consequences or be harmful to you in some fashion. The other thing we see here that, that gives us this feel of it's a man-made plan rather than a God-ordained covenant is the knitted white attire. White will typically think, uh, cause us to think about things of the spirit, okay? Things that are pure, things that are holy. However, various little pieces of uh, an image will shift that just a little bit and take us away from the normal positive meaning of the color white into a more negative meaning. In a negative sense, white will often speak of a religious spirit. And in this case, knitted. Knitted is a process by which man is diligently working. Usually it's a woman, I know, but I, I know a couple men who knit as well. So a, a person is diligently working with the thread, with the yarn to stitch it together with their own hands. That is man's hands rather than God's hands. So uh, it, it has a lot more to do with the effort of man to knit a garment than it does for one to be sewn or for one to be manufactured. So that speaks to more of man's effort in this. The dream leaves you with, there's an issue coming, be aware of it. That always ends with be in prayer, be prepared, and be ready to deal with it when it arises rather than it overcoming you. Great dream. Great dream. Okay, let's see here uh, what we've got next. Let me look uh, and just sort of go down our list a little bit. Um, Kathy's working on a few of those, so I want to be sure I'm not catching something she's already doing. Uh, let's see. Jovina, I believe your dream is still on our list uh, to cover. Uh, our son, Josiah, was playing with his friend, Apostolus, a messenger of God, right, in our current backyard, and then a couple of other boys from school came along too. Josiah went in the house and invited the boys to come in. They continued to play outside. Then he saw a green or yellow or green and yellow rattlesnake coming near them, and he told them to come inside, and they did so. Snake was trying to get in, but Josiah stepped out the door and stepped on the neck of the snake to kill him, but the snake did bite him. He yelled, Mom, I came and brought a syringe to remove the poison. Really, really great dream. I was initially looking at this thinking, I need to look up what the name Josiah means because this dream may speak to uh, the meaning of the name, but it's Apostolos that speaks to the meaning of the name. Josiah is representative of your son. Now, how do we know Josiah is the child, the son, and Apostolos is the name? It's straight up, it's discernment, it's the feel of the dream. As we walk through the dream, we can see that this dream is about your son, but that the messenger who is there is there to prepare him for something, to get him ready for something. So what's this dream mean? This dream is a calling dream for your son that is also giving you an intercessory 
uh, a responsibility to cover him and protect him in the, in his calling. But this dream says he has a calling to identify the attacks and plans of the enemy, things that would come that would create fear and that would create envy and jealousy among his peers, among those around him, uh, fear-based attacks that would cause harm to his friends. God is going to give him insight to see the attacks before they occur and to help others escape those attacks. Now, in that, he carries authority over the enemy to put him under his feet. But there are going to be times when he is hurt in the process. See, we tend to think this is not as much interpretation as just godly wisdom from a, a longtime pastor and teacher. We tend to think that God would never, ever let us get hurt at all when we're doing what he's asking us to do. And that is true. It's not his plan for us to get hurt. But there are times when we step out in ways that maybe come out of a place of protection inside the house where he's safe, but going a little too far rather than drawing people into a place of safety, stepping out to take the enemy on before the right timing of it, and he gets bitten. But the Lord will always have people around him through prayer, like you as a mother, but also as a spiritual warrior, to cover him and help bring healing because we don't want anyone that comes to him to stop him from fulfilling his purpose, his call, and his destiny. Great, great dream. And do not worry that the snake bites him. The cool thing about this is that whatever harm the enemy might try to bring, God has already pre planned for it, prepared for it, and anywhere the enemy gets through, he's going to have people there to bring healing and life so that there would not be a loss of purpose, vision, and destiny. Amazingly good dream. One thing to mention about this one, uh, I talked about the names, Josiah actually being the person, the son, and Apostolos, the messenger that does the preparatory work that prepares him for this. But but let's talk briefly about the snake. It's a rattlesnake. Uh, one of the things that's cool about a rattlesnake is the idea that it warns before it strikes. So this speaks to the idea that your son is going to have the capacity to hear and perceive the warning signs that allow him to rescue others from places of danger. Great dream, great calling, and, and it's a place to put a lot of prayer into so that he would walk in in safety and security and in peace. All right, let's see here now. Looking at our list a little bit more, again, I want to make sure. Okay, I think the first dream that Kathy did was Brenda's. So I can jump now to, let's see, Sharon's dream. Sharon, oh, hey, Sharon, talking. Good to see you. Uh, Sharon's got a dream here that says, A friend had a dream about my daughter. In the dream, my daughter went to walk at the pond where she works. And she came back. When she came back, she had a sparrow and brought it into the work building. End of dream. Okay. Now, I want to mention something. This is a more difficult dream to interpret for a couple of reasons. They're very simple, practical reasons. We're now dealing with a written dream as opposed to being able to hear it spoken, which is actually, just so you understand, is actually much harder for me to interpret. I, I hear when I'm hearing the dream much better. It's one of the reasons I'm reading these dreams out loud. Uh, I hear better when I'm, when the, I, I, I receive revelation when I'm hearing the dream spoken or seeing someone talk about it than I do reading it. Now we're not adding to that the issue of it is not your dream, it is a dream of another person. That puts it a third party out yet again. So a little more challenging, a little more difficult. There are a couple of things that would make this dream clearer, and that would be uh, being able to talk to the dreamer to get a little better feel for some more of the details of the dream to help us understand why your daughter is in the dream. Uh, um, I don't know if this is Rachel, Rebecca, uh, I don't know which daughter it is, but what I would say to you about this dream is that this dream speaks to uh, um, a relationship between your daughter and the individual in, in the spirit. It doesn't have to be in the natural. I would ask the question, I'm not sure I'll be able to find it even if you answer it, about if they work together or if the workplace is a symbol in the dream. So if, if I were talking to the person, so let me just speak to this part of the dream. 
this dream says that the Lord is sending your daughter out and, and will bring her back with a level of provision or supply that's needed for the place in which she's called to work. Now, the dream may be extrinsic for the dreamer, which is that is it's about your daughter, or it may be intrinsic, which would relate more to the Lord is going to provide for the dreamer through friends or through something your daughter represents. Can't be sure about that because of the steps of the dream in sort of out there just a little bit. Where do we get that provision, that, I, that idea? Um, uh, the Lord cares even about the sparrows. And so he cares about the little things. A sparrow doesn't go without food. A sparrow, you know, just like the flowers of the field don't go without clothing. The Lord presents the sparrow as a picture of he cares and he always provides. And that's what this dream is really about. Whether it's about the dream or their self or it's about your daughter, it's about he cares about the little things. And as they go out and come in, there's going to be provision for the work they're called to. I'll let you discern. Uh, uh, Sharon, because I know you're capable of doing that, who the dream actually applies to in this case. So, uh, because you'll have a closer feel to that dream more directly. With that, I'm going to jump on to the next one. The next one is Peggy's dream. Let's see here, uh, Peggy's dream. My husband had a dream. He was at a shopping center, and as we were walking, there was an empty purse and a crescent wrench. And he turned and picked them up to take them in the store. And when you went in the store, someone at the door said there was a pair of scissors needed. And he turned around, looked back in the parking lot and saw a table and there were scissors on the table. And he went to return to the door and handed the scissors in. Then he, then, uh, he woke up. And this dream is about uh, uh, supply, provision and calling. Uh, great dream. I'll interpret it quickly. And then we'll talk about some of the elements of it. This dream says, that the Lord is putting your husband in a place where he can identify those who have lost their identity and their favor, and he will have the ability to adjust to help meet those needs. But the Lord, in the midst of doing that, is going to give him even more insight to find the things that are necessary to cut off what the enemy had planned against them. And all of those pieces will come together as he enters in to that place of purpose, destiny, and calling. Okay, so the dream is really a, a cool dream about the ability to help and aid others. What Where we get this one empty purse. A purse for most women is where they carry their identification papers, you know, driver's license, social security card, things like that. So it has to do with identity, but it's empty loss of identity do with we carry our resources our money uh that means in other words uh what we're able to obtain favor or opportunity with so it's a loss of favor because it's empty it, it, many other things can be carried in person it's a loss it's a lack of something the crescent wrench what does the crescent wrench speak to a crescent wrench speaks to this idea that you can place that wrench on a bolt or a nut and then adjust it or maneuver it so that it changes its size to fit the nut or the bolt that you put it on. That speaks to the flexibility that he has. But then being able to see the loss and have flexibility to help meet the need or bring things to the place they're needed does not mean he has all the answers. So as he comes to the door to enter into that place of provision, to enter into the store, a place where all the supplies are to be purchased and obtained, to enter into that place of position, the Lord will direct him to the specific things needed to cut off the enemy's plan and allow him to uh, obtain what's needed in that way. Great, great dream. All right, I'm going to try and do a couple more really quick. Um, and then I see we get to the ones that Kathy started on. So uh, let's look at uh, Tashonda uh, and uh, Henderson. We're going to look at your dream here uh, real quick. I dreamt about being in a grassy area with my old car and it was broken down. I remember it having to be pushed out of the way next to a tree. 
I was walking through people who were holding hands, praying in different languages, like different tribes of people. And I saw myself trying to go under or through their arms to attempt to get to where I was going. I woke up before I made it. Great dream. Really good dream. And, and, and let me just take this opportunity to teach you a little something else. When you're interpreting dreams, particularly when you're interpreting dreams for others, now all these have really been cool dreams, and I mean that sincerely. But let me just give you a little, a little uh, tip. There's no dream that's a bad dream. The worst nightmare is not a bad dream. There's a lesson to be learned from even the worst night terror, nightmare, or warfare dream. There's a lesson to be learned there. It's a good dream. God is not interested in conveying to the dreamer what's wrong. God is interested in conveying hope and a future and, and, and uh, life and value. So he'll bring a lesson out of even the darkest, deepest dreams. Therefore, you'll never t hear me say, oh, that's a terrible dream. Just, I'm not going to do it. If it's a horrible dream, I'm going to find the light and the light and the truth in it. And therefore, it's going to become a good dream. But these have all been truly good, uh, 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 wonderful dreams. Uh, so let's look at this one. I just had to say that because I've said great dream so many times. Uh, let's look at this one real quick. This dream is about the old ways you've done things, whether that be in ministry or in life. They're not working anymore. And it's been it's time has come to push the old ways out of side aside and come under a new level of leadership and authority so that you can move into a new place. The Lord has positioned people intercessors, people who will move in the spirit and from many different walks around you to stand together, to undergird you and to lift you up. It's not that you have to break through those people in the dream. It is that you have to pass between them or through them so that they're surrounding you in the process of getting to where you're going. Now, the Lord dream does not give you the answer that you've made it. It says you're on the journey. So this dream is far more about letting go of old things and trusting that God has you covered, surrounded, and protected with a great cloud of witnesses, with a host of intercessors, with people from many backgrounds, many styles, many uh, faces that are going to help cover you and usher you in to the place to which you're called. You will not fail. You're going to succeed because he set the tone and the path for you to make it. Great dream. I love this one. Trees often speak of leaders. That has to do with Nebuchadnezzar's dream in the Old Covenant, where he is a tree. He is the great tree that's cut down to the stump, and Nebuchadnezzar is the tree. That's our biblical base for where we get the idea that trees are often leaders. It doesn't have to speak to a specific leader. In this case, it talks about coming under. You push the car under a, a, a tree, so under a, a new place of leadership, be covered in a new way. Uh, the old vehicle, and it's broken down. Remember what I said about vehicles earlier, cars, boats, trains, etc. has to do with how you get from here to there. So it has to do with your life or ministry. Therefore, this dream speaks to the old things that have broken down in your life, in your purpose, in your destiny, in your ministry, but that you know you have a new destination. And you're going to have to get there in a new way, in a new fashion. Great, great dream. Uh, Larry, let's look at your dream real quick, and we'll see what we have time for. We'll probably end with this one. Uh, so let's look at it real quick, though, and see. Uh, last night I had this dream. I'm in a large meeting room. I am with U.S. senators from all over the country. Someone is taking me around the room to see things. Next, I'm setting, uh, sitting at a round table. I'm with two U.S. senators, and another person is taking a picture of me, and the two senators like a selfie. Also sitting at the table is a third senator. This third senator does not seem to want to join in. Finally, I see a glimpse of my son, Brandon. Brandon does not have a shirt on. And his upper body is very muscular and developed. His pectoral muscles are bulging and his back is very V-shaped. That's all I can recall. Okay, 
This is an interesting dream. Now, let me give a disclaimer here. It's very important. I believe in open transparency. I know Larry pretty well. I also know a little bit about Larry's family, and I know a little bit about Brandon. So I want to be clear on the front side here that there are things I know that could influence this interpretation. Now, let me mention something else here before we jump to the interpretation. One, I know Larry is perfectly capable of interpreting his own dreams. But you need to understand our own dreams are difficult for us to interpret. Many times we need help and support from others, particularly when they relate to people, family, like a son, or our own life in such a way that we would naturally question what we're hearing or be concerned, am I getting it right? So uh, uh, it's, it's not uncommon to ask for assistance from someone else who is mature in the realm of dream interpretation, even when you could interpret your own. So that's number one. Second thing to understand is that because I know certain things about Larry and I'm a friend of Larry's, this, this interpretation is going to be much more to help bring confirmation. And Larry knows that I could be influenced by what I know naturally. It's always better not to know anything and just be led completely by the spirit. But but when we put that on the table and we're transparent, it opens the door for the Lord to be able to move even when some of those little pieces come into play. So Larry, I think this dream actually speaks to you being taken into a place of true authority to see, transparently see, and be and, and see your son in all his strength, in all his authority, uncovered from the stuff that's been on him in the past and being positioned and seated in the places of authority. And you're going to be put into spheres of influence and in places where there's spheres of influence where you're going to be able to have an impact upon what his uh, his positioning is and how others even see him. So I really think this speaks to the Lord strengthening your son, increasing his capacity to carry government, uh, the pectoral muscles that, that move into the shoulder areas and give strength to the shoulder areas. Government is on his shoulders. So the, this moving into that place where he's strengthened to carry these things, it, it's a very uh, uh, well-defined capacity. But the Lord is putting you in a place spiritually to have impact and influence on movers and shakers over those with authority. And while you may be resisted by some in the spirit, you're going to have a lot of relationship with others that will bring things into the light that will display Brandon's strengths. So this is another one of those intrinsic, extrinsic dreams that speaks to a personal call, but a role uh, that you'll play on behalf of another. That is, in this case, your son. So, uh, with that, uh, let's just check here real quick and see um, uh, what else there is, if there's anything else we can do quickly before we go. Um, I'll scroll down to the bottom. There's several more of you um, that have listed some things. I don't have time to get to all of those. We're hitting our about 8.30 mark. I've been trying to hold these to about an hour and a half. Um, so uh, there is, uh, I know that Kathy has done several of these. I'll try and look back through these later. I just have to be honest with you. I typically don't have time to go back through all the comments and check on them to determine has everybody's dream got interpreted. Um, Art or Carol Hernandez, um, Kathy Brown, and a couple of others will sometimes be able to look at the dreams uh, and pick up some when the video is over. Kathy's actually mentioned she would be trying to do that. So keep in mind that if you don't see the interpretation of your dream while the live stream is going on, you do want to go back and check and see if one of our, our, our support folks, some of these great folks, please join me in praying for and blessing Kathy Brown and some of these others. They do this voluntarily. They jump on and they help with these dreams. Kathy, let me just say to you, God bless you. Thank you so much for helping with this kind of stuff. I'm so grateful. Uh, I don't know if some of you realize the challenges it can take 
to get this live on the air and, and, and make it work. Just not just the technical challenges like we had at the beginning of this, but just the challenges of trying to get to all of you and accomplish these things. We'll have anywhere from 30 to 100 people in live in person or online for these e events, for these dream labs. And so it is a bit challenging at times. So I just want to thank you guys for patience and thank the folks who help us with it. Just amazingly supportive uh, with that. I really uh, do, do appreciate that. Let me just give you a couple of little tidbits of information that would be really helpful to us here um, in the ministry we're doing and um, that you could be helpful to us with. Please, please, please keep us in prayer. This, I said, as I said, this is not easy. I have a pretty hefty schedule of traveling and speaking. That's one of the reasons we wanted to start trying to do a little bit, a bit of this online only so we don't have to cut out our monthly lab when I'm traveling. Uh, and, and so I think it worked okay uh, for tonight. So we'll, we'll keep working on it to improve it. Uh, but the second thing I want to share with you is um, not only keep us in prayer, but keep in mind that uh, we can always use your financial support. At the top of the page on the Facebook page, there's a donate button. It should take you to a page on Patria Ministries. That's the overall ministry that I oversee, and it's the nonprofit through which we receive donations, so that it can be a tax deductible donation. Uh, we want to encourage you to help us with that, particularly when we do something like this totally online. We still have a lot of the same expenses. I don't have the the, the uh, multimedia staff that, that we try and support when I'm uh, in person, but we still have a lot of the same expenses for equipment and things of that nature. We don't do anything for Reese for money. I don't do anything to get you to give. I do these things because I love you and I want you to learn to interpret. So there's never a cost to this. We never charge a fee. I occasionally do a conference or event or something where there's a registration fee, but I never charge a fee. You guys know most of you. If I'm out, even like if I have my books with me, I'll say, well, the Dream Story book's $15, but if you can't afford it, pick it up. Because I want what God has put in me to be released for you. On the other side of that coin, I also know that God has made you guys good stewards. And he, he uses his people uh, to fund his work. But more than that, I believe that this is a kingdom <coughs> purpose, that learning to walk in this realm of revelation is a kingdom purpose that's good ground. And when you sow into good ground, there's a return that comes on that. So I really want to encourage you, not that there's a necessity to sow, but I really want to encourage you that I believe it is something God has taught me. I really struggle with this. He's taught me to learn to give you the opportunity to do. When we're online only, the only opportunity to that is through the donate button on the Facebook page. You can go to www.dreamstories.com mydreamstories.com and uh, there's donate button there but let me also mention to you the things that are available to you on my dream stories now, i have been traveling a ton i'm way behind on dream interpretation on the website please keep in mind if you've posted dreams on the website i'm almost a month behind right now i apologize for that but there are times there's just nothing i can do about that kathy and art and others are helping us try and catch that up from time to time but it also just is what it is, and we don't charge for it. Nobody makes a living doing it, so it's straight up volunteer time, and we do it as quick as we can. Bear with us. Be patient with us. We'll get to your dreams if we have it yet. If you post a dream there, no, we're trying to catch up, and we will get to your dream. Uh, second thing to know about the website is the forum. That's the forum where you can post a dream. You can post a question about dreams, or you can post a symbol for help with it. The other thing that's available on the forum, on the website, is the idea of um, the blog entries. And we're behind. For some reason, July's blog entries did not post. I'm not sure what happened. We must have, I just noticed it didn't go up. So I'm going to go back and check that and get it up. It was written and out there. Uh, we're doing a blog entry this month on word plays and puns. It's a great, uh, a fun uh, uh, blog entry this month. But lots of different um, 
topics out there that you can learn about and you can go back to the archives on. We also post a symbol every Monday. I got behind on those. We're caught up now. Uh, you'll see a new symbol every Monday with some of the characteristics, qualities, and natures of that symbol to sort of help point you in a direction of what the Lord might be speaking through that symbol symbol don't ever go to a dream dictionary for an absolute answer of what a symbol means dreams dictionaries are fine there's nothing wrong with them but don't use them as a dictionary use them as a resource to help you determine what what characteristic quality or nature of that symbol is the one the lord is speaking in that moment you always want to go based on what the lord is saying now not what you've written as a formula holy spirit will not allow you to use a formula holy spirit wants to speak to you personally so keep that in mind great resources there on the dream stories website and uh then i don't know if this lesson will be on youtube i will try and get it moved over there the youtube channel is youtube.com backslash uh michael b french uh i believe is correct that's out there you've got the facebook page or you're probably not watching this right now uh twitter account is at rev mike 88 you can follow me there uh and you also have the website addresses that i mentioned for you uh please make use of those uh, resources they're available to you all the time even when i'm not we try and keep those up to date and current so you can um uh, have them on a, a day in day out basis even when i'm not available we have been working for about a year on a mentoring program or a training program. We still need some equipment to make that work. So just keep us in prayer with that. We need a camera and we need some internet equipment and some computer equipment to be able to film and to broadcast mobily or uh, mobily um, uh, on the road. So uh, keep us in prayer for those things. Uh, so we can get that running and going. We don't want to start our mentoring program until we can be truly and consistently uh, capable of, of having it going. So um, keep those things in mind. With that said, I'm going to bless you tonight. We were planned for 7 to 8.30 tonight, and I just want to bless you. Thank you for bearing with us with the technical challenges at the beginning. Thank you for joining us and being with us. Sean, I see you come in. Erica, good to see you there. Some of you who've just come on, uh, I think the video replay comes up within about 10, 15 minutes of cutting off the broadcast. But uh, we bless you tonight. Thank you for popping on to see us. So with that, I want to bless you, and then we're going to close out tonight's broadcast. Father, in the name of Jesus. I thank you for those who gathered with us. I ask you would pour your spirit out upon them. Lord, I thank you for hearts that desire to learn and to grow. Would you honor the time that's been spent tonight in pouring out understanding and wisdom, teaching and training, so that they might walk in the fulfillment of their calling, their destinies, and their purposes, and fulfill their visions in Jesus' name. Amen. Bless you guys. We appreciate you, and we'll see you next month. Same time, it'll be the third Tuesday of August. We'll see you online only again next month. Uh, so we'll work on getting a, a little more uh, of our technology up and running by then. But see you then. Amen.